Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Vincy Kwan, and I'm one of the two speaker chairs of the Harvard Undergraduate Health Policy Review, along with my colleague, Hugh Dickinson. The Harvard Undergraduate Health Policy Review aims to inform readers about complex problems facing our healthcare system and to promote discussion of timely issues in the niche field of health policy. We'd like to remind you to please refrain from taking photos or videos of this event in part or in whole. And please also submit questions live to this forum for potential inclusion in today's moderated discussion. Tonight, as part of our speaker series, we are honored to have Mayor Lori E. Lightfoot, 56th Mayor of Chicago, as your first guest of the semester to discuss public health policy leadership. The structure of tonight's event will be as follows. We will hear from Mayor Lightfoot, followed by prepared moderated questions, and then audience questions, which again, you have the opportunity to ask the next door through here. Former Chicago Mayor Lori E. Lightfoot served from May 2019 to May of this year, 2023, as the 56th Mayor of Chicago, during which she led the city through the COVID-19 pandemic creating the COVID-19 Recovery Task Force, as well as a racial equity rapid response team. She's the first black woman and openly gay mayor to serve as the city's mayor and has led with the priorities of equity and inclusion. Prior to taking office, Mayor Lightfoot clerked for a Michigan Supreme Court Justice, held various positions in government, such as the Chief Administrator of the Chicago Police Department of Professional Standards, the Deputy Chief of Chicago Department of Procurement Services, and practiced as a private practice attorney at Mayor Brown and served as a federal prosecutor. Mayor Lightfoot is currently a Richard L. Romay, a Mitchell Senior Leadership Fellow for the fall term at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Please join us in welcoming Mayor Lightfoot. So it's amazing what uh, uh, some free pizza will do on a uh, Wednesday night. Um, I'm happy to be here with you. I'm um, excited about the opportunity to engage in conversation with you. I don't want this to be a monologue for an hour. Um, I want this to be an interactive uh, conversation. There's lots of things that I could focus on, and I'm happy to talk candidly about any of the challenges that we face um, in the city of Chicago. But I want to talk about the opportunities that COVID-19 gave us um, to really right some historic wrongs um, in the city of Chicago, particularly around um, health access and health equity. Now, you may be asking yourself, wait, COVID gave actual opportunities? And the truth is, it did. Um, COVID was, I hope, a once in a lifetime um, experience uh, for us here in the United States. Um, it was a time of great challenge, great uncertainty, really upended people's everyday lives, um, not only caused a uh, health and public health <coughs> crisis, but really I think um, added to uh, the divisions and the polarization uh, that unfortunately are continuing uh, to reverberate uh, to this day. But for us to make progress and keeping people safe, and educating people about what we knew um, as we knew it about the um, pandemic, the disease, the harm that it could wreak, but also the opportunities um, to bring people closer together, to bring people uh, into care. We really had to focus on uh, what we were hearing from the community. And let me start by saying in at the early stages of the pandemic, there were a lot of kind of rogue and wildcat um, organizations that were set up to do testing. Because as you remember, during those times, what we cared about most in January, February, and, and March of 2020 was making sure that people got tested, that we had an understanding of who was positive and who wasn't. That was an incredible obsession um, that frankly all of us were engaged in. But what we also found is a lot of these testing centers uh, that could st got stood up during that time, didn't care about the data. And in some instances, frankly, we found that they weren't even um, set up to actually give a readout to people of what their testing results were. So we had to deal with that issue 
But one of the biggest challenges that we faced in the city of Chicago was making sure that we got demographic information about who was getting tested and who was testing positive, importantly. Because we needed to know what the impact of <clears throat> this horrible virus was on communities across our city. So we finally started getting some of that demographic information in, in April of uh, 2020, early April. And at that point, we learned a devastating fact. And that fact was that black people in the city of Chicago were dying at seven times the rate of any other demographic in our city. Think about that, seven times the rate of everyone else. When I first learned of that data in early April of, of 2020, it was like a gut punch. I immediately thought about my own family, my elderly mother, my siblings who are, um, as I like to remind them, quite a bit older than me, who had underlying conditions and could have been very vulnerable to this horrible virus, because that's what we were seeing in the data. <clears throat> we knew we had to act and act swiftly, but it couldn't just be about telling people the bad news. We had to come up with concrete solutions to address the challenges that we were seeing. And so we came up with something that we call the Racial Equity Rapid Response Team. A little bit of an awkward title, but here's what this team did. We focused on what the data and the science was telling us. We pulled in stakeholders from the community that were working on community health care issues and had been from some time, and we brought them together in one place with us to help us de develop a strategy to go into community to help educate folks, but bust a lot of myths, because there were a lot of myths out there at the beginning of COVID and frankly continue to this day, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, um, but to help us reach people where they were so we could bring needed resources to save people's lives. One of the first communities that we went into, not surprisingly, was a community that we were seeing the highest incidence of death. For those of you who know Chicago, the Auburn Gresham neighborhood on the near south side. Now we had a lot of preconceived plans and ideas about what we were gonna to do to help save this community. <clears throat> but what we found out when we went in to talk to them about public health, to talk to them about COVID, <clears throat> what they told us is, hold up. <clears throat> what we need first and foremost is we need food. We are a food desert. Our people are struggling to keep themselves fed with healthy foods. And so listening to that community and then going back and frankly looking at calls for service to our 311 system, sure enough, the biggest call for service coming out of the Auburn Gresham neighborhood <clears throat> was calls for service around food. So here's an important lesson that we learned quickly in um, dealing with the stakeholders in that community. <clears throat> when you go in a community, you have to have a humble heart and a listening ear. Because if we went in there with preconceived notions and a plan that didn't match up with what the community was telling us was their urgent need, we would never have been successful. And ultimately, in building partnership and bringing what the community told us they needed at that urgent moment, <clears throat> we were able to gain trust and legitimacy to do the work that we knew needed to be done around COVID. So that's an important lesson that I cannot emphasize enough. You cannot go into community thinking you know all the answers. You've got to go into the community and you've got to listen. You've got to be willing to partner and you've got to be willing to address communities' urgent needs, even though it may not be the thing that's the highest priority for you. What will get you to where you need to be is making sure that you are listening and addressing the highest priority for community. So that was an incredibly important lesson. The other thing that we learned is that these long standing issues around general access to healthcare, poverty, <clears throat> but also um, issues that may seem unrelated but were related, affordability of housing, economic development, those things that you don't necessarily associate with healthcare 
but frankly deal with the root causes of the challenges that people were seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. If we didn't address those, just like if we didn't address the food insecurity in Auburn Gresham, we were never going to be viewed as a legitimate force for good. But those opportunities were there. And frankly, with our resources and federal dollars that came, we started to take on some of those seemingly too big to address social issues. And just to give you a little bit of history and provide some context, back in 2013 and 2014, the state of Illinois had a, a governor who was in conflict with the General Assembly. The governor was a Republican, the General Assembly was dominated by Democrats, and because of that conflict, <clears throat> the state didn't pass a budget for two years. Well, who's dependent upon state funding? Lots of people, but in particular social service agencies. People in community that do <clears throat> the, um, I think, the Lord's work and helping individuals and families that run the free clinics, that provide supports for families and young people, that provide substance um, abuse addiction treatment. All the things that you know are important to the fabric of large urban centers. None of those people got paid for two years because of the impasse of elected officials. What was the impact of that? <clears throat> well, you can imagine. Communities were devastated. The infrastructure uh, that you need to have a strong social safety net started to fray. Many of the organizations that were doing this work for decades disappeared because they didn't have enough to sustain not getting paid on a regular basis by the state. And the ones that remained substantially pared back their offerings. So when COVID hit, those organizations that had um, taken these body blows as a result of the fiscal challenges of the state, were just starting to recover when COVID came. The other thing you've got to recognize is with social services agencies that I think are absolutely vital for government to be able to perform its work, they're made up of what? People. People who are experiencing the same thing at the same time that all of us were during the pandemic. So we needed to make sure that we were providing support and resources for those uh, organizations as well. And we heard that loud and clear. And again, we knew that we couldn't take on some of these bigger challenges without making sure that we were channeling resources and support to these community organizations, literally at the block level, so that they could recover. And then another important thing that you need to know is that in many circumstances, those same community organizations um, are, in many instances, the only assets in certain neighborhoods. So making sure that they are strong, that they are vibrant, that they have the ability to build capacity and sustainability became a port an important part of the work that we did through COVID. Now again, not something that you necessarily think was part of fighting this once in a lifetime <clears throat> pandemic, but was absolutely critical for us to be able to make progress. Because if they weren't strong, neighborhoods weren't strong. And if they weren't able to deliver services in support of the work that we were doing, we were never going to reach people. Because many of these organizations are made up of folks from the very same neighborhoods in which this is their service area. They are trusted community partners. So building an alliance and relationship with them was essential to the work that we did during COVID. And because we joined these tables that were already set, and what did I say before? With a humble heart and a listening ear and being prepared as happened, um, not to be accepted, to be viewed with great skepticism because as we know from the research that's already been done, a lot of skepticism around government and particularly healthcare um, was very, very prominent. When we went into these communities with our racial equity rapid response team, we joined tables in many instances that were already set. But some of them we helped convene. Because one of the big powers that a mayor has and a mayor's team is the power of convening. 
people will come to the table. Now they come to the table with their own agendas. They come to the table with preconceived notions about what government can and cannot do, but they will come and they will listen. So you've got to make sure that you get them to stay. And you get them to stay by, again, engaging in authentic relationship building and understanding that how quickly you are able to address these issues really moves at the speed of truth. Let me say that again. How quickly you're able to engage moves at the speed of truth. That means you can't come in and think that you're going to be able to turn the world around in an instant. You're not. What we have found, and I think believe to be true, is that <clears throat> you're able to move as quickly as you gain trust and legitimacy in those communities in which you're trying to serve. And what that means from community to community may be a different thing. What their needs are, what their history is, um, may be different, but you've got to move at the speed that people are ready. You certainly got to bring them along in the journey. You've got to show your presence and that you're not going to just be transactional and only be there for a moment. You've got to demonstrate that you are going to be there for the long haul to help them um, address the challenges uh, that they were facing. And as you might imagine, through COVID, there were many. But that's how you build those foundational relationships, literally brick by brick, person by person, relationship by uh, relationship. So what were some of the things that we were able to accomplish <clears throat> uh, as a result of the approach that we took to building those relationships? Well, let me talk about mental health. Um, in my class today, we reviewed some data that when people think about now health care, they don't just think about their physical health. They also think about their mental health. It's become one of the top priorities that people across the globe are identifying. In the city of Chicago, we used to have 12 um, institutional clinics, so bricks and mortars building that adults could go to to get certain kinds of care. My predecessor closed down many of those mental health clinics. And I, like many people, thought, well, we should just reopen them um, because the clinics are important. Neighborhoods need to have access to, to care. But my public health team, who dealt with behavioral um, health, said, well, wait, not so fast. And here's the issue. We were serving about 3,600 adults at the height of the clinics being open. 3,600. We're a city of almost 3 million. That's nothing. We didn't serve children. We didn't serve adolescents. And we were serving mostly the people with the most acute uh, mental health challenges. So not the full spectrum. But what we were able to do through COVID was um, build up what we call a continuum of care across all of our 77 neighborhoods. And by the end of last year, 2022, remember I said at the height of the clinics being open, we served 3,600 people. By the end of 2022, because of the work that we did in partnership with culturally competent providers across our city, we served over 70,000 people. And for the first time ever, children and adolescents. And we were able to get that work done through COVID. What else were we able to do? The big challenge is that people said, no, 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 these are too tough. You gotta leave those to the side, just focus on COVID. Affordable housing, huge issue literally everywhere in the, on the planet, but particularly in large urban cities. When I came into office, we were down about 120,000 units of affordable housing. That's a significant deficit. So we went to work right away, but then COVID hit. But we continued to persevere because what people told us is we need more housing. We need housing in our neighborhoods. We need housing closer to our work. And so we made the biggest bet in Chicago's history of a $1 billion investment in public housing. And if those projects um, are carried through, what we will see is the first time in a generation that the city of Chicago has taken steps to erase the vestiges of segregation that have kept people 
away from each other for far too long. Big, bold step on affordability because we persevered and we listened to what people um, in our community were telling us. What else were we, were we able to accomplish that goes to uh, making sure that people are fully supported, including uh, in healthcare? Um, we invested over $3 billion into communities on the south and the west side. And again, if you know Chicago, saying south or west side is a proxy for saying black and brown communities. $3 billion. No one has ever done that in the history of our city to start to turn around the decades of disinvestment that have held communities of color back for far too long. We were able to accomplish that even through the pandemic. Critically important because frankly, access to healthcare, a lot of it is about building wealth. If you have a job, if you have supports, then you probably have access to healthcare. But if you don't, then you are on the outside of a system looking in and hoping, frankly, that tragedy doesn't come your way. Because if you're uninsured um, and you don't have the ability to get high quality, affordable healthcare, it can lead to devastation, as I'm sure um, you all know. But we were able to put wealth and money into people's pockets to allow them to have good paying job through our, our economic um, development work. The last thing I'll say, and then I'd love to um, open it up to uh, your questions, is this. People say to me all the time, Mayor, it's, it's too bad that you were the mayor during COVID uh, because you weren't able to get a lot of things done. I hope from just this little bit of conversation, you see that Opportunities always exist, even in the face of terrible tragedy. Opportunities to right historic wrongs um, existed for us all over. From the things that we did from a public health standpoint, the way in which we rebuilt infrastructure, the way in which we made concrete investments uh, in communities, and also did a range of wealth building um, uh, work. All of those things were important. And I think uh, drivers of people's feelings about government, people's feelings about access to health care, um, and I'm very proud of the work that we did. So I'll stop there, and I'm happy to entertain your questions. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Mayor Lightfoot. Yes, sure. uh, we really, really appreciate um, your words, and uh, the message I think resonates really strongly with many of us, the importance of emphasizing more than just medical care when talking about public health and thinking about the issues at hand. Mm -hmm. um, so we're hoping to ask you a few questions sure. now uh, based on the feedback that we received from our audience and of our own ideas. Um, and to begin, before we move into kind of uh, some specific uh, issues of your tenure, uh, we were hoping to just talk a little bit about what public health is to you. Mm -hmm. You know, over the uh, years that public health has been an idea um, academically, and in policy, it's changed a lot from controlling an infectious disease really early on and uh, categorization and, and controlling populations again into moving uh, recognition of social determinants of health, targeting interventions, it's become much broader. Um, in today's social and political climate, a shared definition of public health we feel is essential for advancing forward the interventions that are important to address um, continuing issues. Um, so to that end, um, we're curious how you, Mayor Lightfoot, define public health and how this perspective has been formed by your previous work and your lived experience, and how the definition of public health that you use informs uh, your own health policy and challenges existing health policy. Great question. Uh, for, for me, um, really public health is the, the answer to a lot of challenges that we see uh, facing people in their day-to-day -day life. You know, as I, as I outlined, um, and, and I will say, coming into to office, I didn't think a whole lot about public health. Um, I thought, okay, we have flu season, we have vaccines. Um, but if we childhood illnesses, we have uh, a network of uh, providers who um, help with that. But, but living through um, COVID, as I did, um, at a time of incredible challenge all over the world, um, I really came to appreciate and understand uh, the importance of public health. And that's why I do feel it is the solution 
to many of the challenges that we face. And let me give you a couple of uh, examples. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we face in Chicago um, and have faced for decades is the issue of community violence. And to solve the challenge of community violence and really bring lasting peace in my mind, you really have to take a public health uh, approach and analysis to the challenge. What's going on in those communities that is um, uh, where we see young people, particularly young men of color, picking up guns and doing harm not only to themselves, people who look like them, uh, but their communities. What's happened that in many instances it feels like they don't have a consciousness about their own humanity, they don't have a sense of what their own future is. Um, and a lot of that comes down to um, trauma that they've experienced from a very young age. A lot of it comes down to uh, poverty um, and other, um, again, social determinants of health. So in order to solve for those problems, you have to think about the entire ecosystem of what's happening in, in community safety. Obviously, law enforcement has a role to play. I'm a former federal prosecutor. I worked in the uh, Chicago Police Department, so I know that you've got to hold dangerous, violent, habitual offenders um, accountable um, for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is so that victims feel like there is a thing called a justice system. But in order to stop the pipeline of young people to the streets that leads to their destruction and, and, and a perpetuation of a cycle of violence and trauma, you really do have to think about this from a public health perspective. So again, to me, public health is at the root of solving community violence. And of course, you know, the biggest example is we have a pandemic. Public health, I think, is critically important, but public health partnership uh, with other um, institutions and organizations is critically important. One thing that I did mention, which continues to redound to the, I think, benefit of people in Chicago, is the alliance of hospitals um, who recognize that they have to step up, think beyond their own institutional needs, and partner together to help solve a particular problem. As, as was the case, I think, in many cities across the world, in Chicago, we were absolutely um, focused on making sure that our healthcare system didn't collapse. And you didn't see us, like you saw so many other cities, frankly, with um, long lines of people waiting to get basics um, protections against COVID-19. Um, unfortunately, refrigerator trucks lined up because so many people uh, were dying. Uh, the lack of resources and preparation that plagued other cities we didn't have in Chicago, fortunately, but that's because there was a great emphasis for years in our public health department on preparedness. But part of that uh, preparedness is making sure the hospitals cooperated with each other. So we have a significant number, like Boston does, of um, for-profit hospitals, uh, but also safety net hospitals. Normally, they don't communicate with each other at all. Um, we made sure for our public health department that everybody was at the table. Everybody was cooperating. Everybody understood. It was mission critical uh, for them to be communicating about what they were seeing in their emergency departments, in their COVID ward. Um, they cooperated in sharing resources like ventilators. Remember, uh, there was a time early on in COVID where there was a huge shortage nationwide of ventilators. We didn't have those kinds of challenges in Chicago because we forged important um, connections between the hospitals, uh, the federally qualified um, healthcare centers, and other people who were part of the healthcare ecosystem in Chicago all working um, together. So I've strayed a little bit from your question, um, but to me, public health, as I said, is the answer to so many challenges, and it has to go beyond just thinking about the narrow healthcare issues to how you win trust with, and appear as a, a um, legitimate force for good uh, in communities. So obviously, I have a very expansive notion of public um, health. Thank you so much. You highlighted in your remarks today your council's work to expand citywide mental health network mm -hmm. services um, to all 77 neighborhoods yep. and especially to all people regardless of health insurance 
ability to pay, immigration status, like, and in fact, you increased the budget for mental health since you assumed office by more than sevenfold. Mm -hmm. And while during COVID, it became more and more agreed upon that mental health is a public health priority, I can also imagine that there may have been some resistance towards this dramatic budgetary increase. Um, could you give us a, a bit of a view into how you came across this priority, but also the process of expanding the budget and the services? Well, I really have to credit um, our public health commissioner and the, the team that led uh, behavioral health. They saw the increasing crisis. When we announced this program in the fall of 2019 before anybody was really thinking about um, COVID, um, way before that. We re announced it in, I think, October of 2019. So we saw that there's this need in our city. Um, and our public health department routinely does uh, polling um, of residents around a range of different uh, mental health questions to help guide um, the policy prescriptions um, that they focus on and place emphasis on. So we were just seeing this challenge of uh, access to culturally competent um, mental health services, particularly for children and juveniles, even before COVID hit. And that's really what was the, the data that was underlying uh, the program. I, I, we really didn't get a lot of resistance in terms of our budgetary priorities um, because we didn't we didn't set it up to say we're going to do this and not that. Um, when I came into office, we were facing at that point the largest budget deficit in the history of the city, eight hundred thirty-eight million dollars, which is a daunting task, I can tell you. But we were able to close that deficit that first year without any reductions in services, without any layoffs, um, because we did a lot of um, I think fiscally sound ways to make um, city government work more efficiently, but making that those decisions also making decisions about uh, continuing to invest. There are sometimes um, in government where when you face a fiscal crisis, everything gets put on hold, no new investments, no innovation. That's just simply not the way we approach uh, the governance during the um, uh, city of Chicago when I was mayor. Next year we face an even larger budget deficit of $1.2 billion because of COVID-induced uh, um, COVID um, shutdown of our economy and reducing our normal revenue streams. But there again, we close that gap without any reductions in service um, and without any, any layoffs and continue to do investments in community that we knew were critically important. When you bring more people into the economy, when you generate more wealth, um, even though in the short term you may be making a monetary investment that looks like um, an increase in um, the size of the budget, it redounds to your benefit. Uh, and if you manage it correctly, it could redound uh, many times over. And that's the, the mentality that we took to making investments in things like mental health. Thank you. There's a related question from an audience member regarding mental health from Neeraja Kumar, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, they ask, what steps were taken to regulate the mental and physical health of first responders mm -hmm. overworked during the pandemic? That's a great question. Um, a couple of things. Um, number one is we made the largest investment um, specifically in, in police um, in the history of the city. We put $20 million into uh, one of our first budgets uh, to make sure that we were doing a couple of things. Number one was uh, to really build out mental health services uh, for uh, the police. We have the second largest police force um, in the country in Chicago, about 12,000 strong. Um, but we only had three clinical social workers that were available to address the challenges that our police force was facing on a regular basis. I mean, woefully insufficient. And that three had been the same for years and years and years. You know, police officers were viewed as warriors, um, that they didn't have the same kinds of um, stress and challenges that ordinary mortals did. Well, that's just simply not true. And we were seeing um, in Chicago, but really nationwide, a significant uptick in officer suicides. So we knew we had to do something um, urgently to address that issue. 
and making those investments by expanding um, resources that are available uh, to police officers, working on ways with them to destigmatize um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the access, accessing mental health um, challenges, because there's a, a big myth in policing that if you go and you see a counselor, then you have the risk of losing your Ford card, which means you can't carry a gun, which means that you can't be a, a police officer. None of that is true, but that myth is so pervasive. So we spent a lot of time making sure that we were addressing that. We also provide mental health supports um, for family members as well. Family members of first responders go through the job with the person who's actually on the job, whether it's a firefighter, whether it's um, a 911 operator. I've worked at the city's 911 um, center for a number of years. And just imagine for eight hours, you're listening to call after call of people um, having the worst day of their life and begging for help. That goes somewhere. And so making sure that those people also have access to high quality um, uh, mental health resources uh, through uh, their union, but also through the city was critically important. So we made those concrete examples. And also, frankly, with the police and fire, making sure that they had scheduled time off, that we weren't uh, um, going 10 days, 12 days, uh, even um, at the height of the challenges that we face in the city, um, and not giving people an opportunity um, to have time off. I know from my own experience, I was the president of uh, the Chicago Police Board, which is essentially like an administrative court that heard allegations of serious misconduct by police officers. I saw cases in which officers made mistakes that were um, uh, ended up resulting in serious injury because they weren't taking time off between shifts. We wanted to make sure that we address that issue, and we did. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, following up on uh, the the theme of the last question and discussing mm -hmm. the, the impact of the pandemic, obviously you've already spoken significantly um, to what that was like as the mayor in the city and all of the um, successes that you've had in pushing forward policy. Mm -hmm. I think we can all remember those days of March when COVID was sweeping across the country, those days in December of 2020 as cases were spiking, as our friends and families were getting infected and at risk of death. Can you speak to what it was like on a day-to-day -day basis as mayor to approach these challenges, to implement policy, and, and to do your utmost mm -hmm. to protect the city? I think it's hard for us who haven't had that experience to imagine what that could have been like. <clears throat> Well, it's an experience I hope I never have again, to be sure. Um, it was really difficult. Um, in the early days, we really didn't know much. Um, and stepping back, let me just say this. Normally, when you have a public health crisis of this magnitude, um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC as, as we know it, are really there to step in and take charge of the crisis, to give very specific guidance, um, to make sure that there are resources that are available at the local level. You know this, but our public health system is very fractured. Um, what happens in one location may be something very different in another location, particularly around resources, uh, preparation, levels of expertise. Um, as an aside, let me share that from February of 2020 through the end of May 2020, every Sunday night, um, I led a call for one hour with about two to 300 uh, mayors and village presidents in the surrounding areas so of much smaller communities than Chicago who didn't have access to information, they didn't have access to resources. So our public health team um, and our, frankly, our team in Washington, D.C. provided uh, uh, substantive information and answer the questions of these mayors and um, town managers um, who were desperate for information so they could help advise their residents and they weren't getting that support from anywhere else. So we provided that um, to them. I think that's frankly one of the best things that we did um, during COVID. But I will tell you there were days and um, from essentially 
end of February through the end of May, I worked literally every day, seven days a week, 12 to 14 hours every day without a break, as did my team. That is not a quick way to live your life, I can assure you. We had to make literally life and death decisions every single one of those early days. And we were doing it with the best information that we had, but I'm not going to tell you that we made perfect <coughs> decisions. Making decisions about um, what, how you're going to um, resource communities, knowing that you're never going to have enough resources to address everyone's needs. Making decisions about shutting down parts of our economy, um, knowing that in many instances the workers are dependent upon things like conventions and meetings and hotels and restaurants. They had no recourse. They had no cushion. They were living paycheck to paycheck. And knowing that um, for the greater good of public health, which was the right decision to make, that you were putting these people out of work and that they were going to struggle um, uh, financially, those are hard, hard decisions to make. We made them because it was the right thing to do. I made them. But it was very difficult not to lose sight, uh, very difficult. And it was important for me not to lose sight of the human beings that were going to be impacted by the decisions that we made on a regular basis. Um, but I, I think there's going to be parts of that time that I'm going to be unpacking uh, for Flushing, um, really for the rest of my life. Um, I'm working on a couple of books, and I'm stuck to some extent because it's so hard to go back and relive that traumatic time. But I think it was a significant time, certainly a significant time in my personal life, um, meaning my life, my life as an individual, my life as a mayor, my life as a leader, but my life as a human um, during that time. And there's stories that I want to make sure I share and tell um, for the next mayor, uh, hopefully 100 plus years or maybe longer, if we're lucky. Um, but there's a lot that we can learn and should be memorialized um, from our experience in COVID. You know, the last time that we had a crisis of this magnitude across the world was the 1818, uh, sorry, 1918 um, uh, uh, flu uh, epidemic. There's not a lot of um, real-time information that was memorialized from that time period. We're, we're going to do a much differently um, as a result of our experience with COVID, but there's nothing like being a big city mayor, having to make those frontline decisions, looking in the eyes of workers, looking in the eyes of healthcare workers. Um, let me just share this last piece and then we can move to the next question. We went through this horrible time in the spring and early summer. And people were really starting to feel COVID fatigue. And then we had a spike of COVID in the fall and as we went into winter. <clears throat> Vaccines came to the city of Chicago on December 15, 2020. And we started a mandate of the CDC vaccinating healthcare workers. I went to so many vaccination events in those early days. And these heroic healthcare workers been on the front lines risking their lives for people that were so sick coming into hospitals. They didn't know that a cure was on the way. They didn't know a vaccine. They showed up every single day to help us. And when they got vaccinated, the tears of joy and relief, the palpable sense of um, release that I felt in her presence. It's just something I'm, I'm never going to forget. For a lot of people, they sacrifice a lot to help people that they might not even know their name. And we can't forget those sacrifices. Time, we'd like to address some of the board of bonding questions that are coming in. Um, 
in particular, we have one regarding the pandemic um, from Anish Mazinger. What are the key strategies and initiatives that have been implemented to improve the public health infrastructure and pandemic preparedness of the city of Chicago um, so that the same so that the same issues seen during this past COVID-19 pandemic can be addressed or modified before, hopefully, it won't come before the next potential pandemic or wide-scale public health crisis? Well, that's a great question, and I'll answer it this way. When I came into office, our public health department was woefully under resourced. You know, we're the third largest city in the country, and we had a public health department that we would serve like the 30th largest city in the country. So even before we started seeing federal dollars coming, we started pouring more money into the public health department in a range of programs um, that it does. And again, you know COVID, we talked about mental health, but also they were on the front lines of um, <coughs> um, maternal health, infant health, um, working with <coughs> reproductive health care providers, uh, doing work with um, organizations that support uh, people who uh, are suffering from um, substance uh, abuse. So a range of different things that a lot of people don't remember or think about. HIV AIDS, huge um, part of our public health system. We made sure that the department increased its budget from our corporate budget and not just from grant dollars. Grant dollars come and go. There's a million strings that are attached uh, to federal grant dollars. It frankly made it very difficult for us to, to operate. Um, even though the money was well-intentioned, the, the, the reporting requirements, um, the rigid ways in which line items could be used made it difficult for us to operate. So have, making sure that the public health department was properly resourced the city of Chicago corporate dollars and not just grant dollars um, was, I think, incredibly important. You know, preparedness, um, which is part of the question, I think is also something important, and I'll share an anecdote. In the fall of 2019, again, pre, way pre-pandemic, there was a um, national exercise on um, preparedness um, that happened in the city of Chicago. And the question was a live <laughs> exercise, um, really trying to integrate federal, state, county, and local resources, responding to, believe it or not, a virus of unknown um, genealogy, if you will, that but originated in China. So our public health department was very much involved in that exercise, um, and when we started to see COVID take hold, was able to draw upon that very recent experience in responding. So making sure that we continue to be well-resourced, making sure that we continue to emphasize uh, preparedness, um, and that we continue to support the broad array of programs that the Public Health Department has been engaged in historically, and new ones that came online uh, during COVID. Um, critically important. You mentioned just now the the issue of substance use disorders, yeah. um, and in parallel to the COVID pandemic, there was also the opioid overdose epidemic, yeah. which is still ongoing. And in March, you announced an initiative where you would redirect funds from settlements of pharmaceutical companies yeah. to address the communities hit hard by these op opioid epidemics. Given that you mentioned you know, change moves at the speed of establishing trust, and within these communities, there were there was a sense of loss of trust with physicians, family physicians. What are the methods or strategies that your council has used to ensure that these dollars actually go to the communities that were affected the most? Well, the truth is, in many of these communities, there weren't a lot of physicians, and certainly not a lot of physicians who actually look like the community. <laughs> One of the biggest challenges that we faced um, during through the pandemic and continues is we don't see physicians of color coming out of med schools and being committed um, to come to um, communities of color, particularly 
low income uh, communities of color. Number one, there aren't a lot of physicians of color being um, coming out of med schools, there just aren't. Um, and then getting them to make a commitment to servicing um, our populations. And when I say our, I'm just in Chicago, but I mean large urban centers uh, is, a, is an ongoing challenge that has to be addressed. But the people who are suffering from um, substance um, abuse disorders uh, have a range of other challenges and, and the substance abuse is just frankly one manifestation of that. Um, so again, getting culturally competent care, destigmatizing um, the addictions that are out there, which is incredibly important. And the only way you can bring people to care is by developing those real one-on-one -on -one authentic relationships with them and making sure that there are resources in their community. Because one of the things we learn from talking to patients about mental health, but I think it applies in other circumstances, is if the resources are not there in their community and accessible, they're not going to use them. So having centralized resources, that people have to travel great distances in a city like Chicago, it's not going to work. That's part of the reason we, at, uh, even with 12 clinics open, we're only serving 3,600 people. It's not going to happen. You've got to have the resources right there in their neighborhoods uh, and available to them. Thank you so much. For the last audience question I'd love to take, uh, someone is asking, can you speak a little bit more on the climate of incarceration rates in the city of Chicago, particularly your observations of and responses to community jail cycling and how the intersection of policing and infection rates have changed over time? It's a great question, a complicated question. <clears throat> We're going through an interesting time in Chicago and really in Illinois because um, the legislature um, eliminated cash bail, and that law signed into signed by the governor was recently upheld. And so the no cash bail regime, if you will, went into effect on September 18th. I think the challenge that we see is this: for too long, our county jail was a debtor's prison. I mean, pure and simple. We had poor people who couldn't afford bail, and by virtue of that, stayed locked up. And it's not like they got a speedy trial. They didn't. Their cases languished in many instances for years. And what happens when you're locked up? You lose contact with family and friends. You lose your job if you had one. And then when you finally get out, you got to start your life almost again from scratch. And Again, many of the poor people who couldn't afford bail were bad off before they were incarcerated, and the incarceration just exacerbated the many challenges um, that they faced. So I have always been a proponent of eliminating cash bail. Um, the challenge, though, is what do you do about the question of community safety? Right. So the, the calculus for judges pre-trial is is Lightfoot um, a flight risk, or is Lightfoot a threat to community? So the concern, um, and we'll see how it plays out over time and what the data tells us, is that by eliminating cash bail, that more and more dangerous habitual offenders are going to be on the street. Um, and let me give you a little data around this. Um, I'm assuming you all know what electronic monitoring is. Electronic monitoring uh, was um, put into play years ago and intended initially for nonviolent offenders, um, people who didn't um, pose a threat to communities. But what we saw through COVID when, for example, Cook County Jail, which is one of the largest in the country, county jails, uh, was a COVID hotspot, there was an effort made which we supported to um, uh, declare yourself the right word, um, to make sure that the jail um, had, frankly, um, wasn't having people on top of each other, it was uh, uh, embracing uh, social distancing 
Um, so there was a lot of work that was done to figure out who should be in a jail, but who shouldn't. And what we saw was a significant increase in the amount of people that were put on electronic monitoring by the courts, which made some sense in the, in the, on the front end. But what we quickly then saw is this was being used to let out people whose lead charge was murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, carjacking, rape. And, you know, I'm a lawyer. I believe in the Constitution. I believe that um, folks um, have a presumption of innocence and that everyone should um, take that presumption of innocence with them as they go through their journey in a criminal justice system. But I also believe that victims have a right to feel safe in their homes on the block um, in their city. And when a victim comes forward and identifies Lightfoot as the one who was the shooter, Lightfoot is the one who um, kidnapped, carjacked, raped, then to see Lightfoot back on the streets 24 or 48 hours after arrest, when they have their bond hearing, what do you think that does to the victims and their feelings about the criminal justice system? So my concern and my observations is, in too many instances, people who are real threats to individuals and to communities are out in Cook County on electronic monitoring. And those 2,500 people, those 5,000 at one point, nobody's actually monitoring them. Nobody's actually providing intervention services because I think some of these people, whether they're adults and particularly juveniles, if they were given an opportunity and an off ramp from the life that they were in, they would take it. They would take it. The supports they would take it and they would try to turn their lives around. But without the other supports that are there, letting them out to go about their business with nobody really monitoring them, not only does that set them up for failure, it raises the risk for community, and I think really not only demoralizes um, victims, but delegitimizes the criminal justice system. So it's a complicated um, issue. Um, and again, I don't think we should just be locking people up um, for petty offenses. There's got to be some alternative, but there's also got to be accountability, right? We teach our children at the youngest possible age that actions have consequences. The criminal justice system has to stand for something about accountability and consequences. Not one-size-fits-all consequences, uh, not the most severe consequences for everybody, but there's got to be some accountability, even in the structure of a presumption of innocence, making sure the trials um, proceed, and so the people have their day in court. <coughs> Thank you for your response. With that, we're mindful that it is now past 9 p.m. Thank you all for joining us for tonight's event. Uh, and we'd also like to thank everyone on Mayor Lightfoot's team for making this event possible, as well as everyone a part of HHPR. And of course, we extend our sincerest gratitude to Mayor Lightfoot for joining us this evening and giving us her precious time. If you haven't already, please help yourself to some food in the back. And once again, thank you so much for your life.